Father, now as we come to your word, we ask that you would, by your Holy Spirit, open your word to us. As we look at these sentences, at these words, as we slow down and pay attention to these details, we ask that you would, by your Spirit, make us see your glory in a new way, in a fresh way, that you, that you would work in our hearts and do what you can only do. We ask that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It must have always seemed, at least, at least to me, it must have always seemed a little bit strange to Paul when he spelled out the first few words of his letters. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I imagine that when Paul wrote words like that, that it was strange to him in the same way that it's strange for a newly married wife to write her full, full, full name for the first time. You know, you've been right, you're used, and I don't know what this is like, but some of you ladies may know. You, you've been used to writing your name uh, one way for so long, and then you get to write it a different way because you have a new last name. And so it's a little bit strange, but it's a happy kind of strange, right? Right? Again, I don't know, but I'm guessing it's a happy kind of strange that you get to write this, this your, your new name. And I imagine Paul felt something like this because... He knew that when he wrote the words, Apostle of Jesus Christ, that he now lived to spread a message that at one time he lived to destroy. It must have been strange for him to now identify himself by the very thing that at one time he thought was a threat to his identity. So even if if we can't quite see it here, Paul has to have felt, he has to have felt the irony of how he begins his letters. It was a little bit strange, I imagine, but strange in a happy kind of way. And it wasn't just strange to him because of what he says about himself, but it was also strange because of those those who he wrote to, like the Colossians, for example. Paul is an unlikely apostle of Jesus, but he's writing to Colossians who were unlikely believers in Jesus. I mean, these people were, they had been, animistic pagan worshipers who had bought into some type of syncretized Jewish religion. And Paul writes to them here in Colossians 1, and he calls them saints, holy ones, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, which means a lot has happened to bring about a letter like this with Paul saying the kinds of things that he's saying here. And so that's the case for all of Paul's letters. There's always more going on, and that's for sure the case here in Colossians. Paul starts this letter like he starts most of his letters. He starts um, by giving thanks for the Colossians. And, of course, there's never a throwaway word when it comes to the Apostle Paul. These first eight verses of Colossians 1 are super important, and this morning I want us to take a closer look. So check out right away. Just look at verse 3 for a minute. Paul starts by giving thanks And he says, the reason for giving thanks in Colossians is because he's heard something about them. This idea of hearing is important. You may have have been, as Michael was reading, you may have heard it repeated several times. It's actually mentioned five times in verses 3 to 8, this idea, this theme of hearing. Hearing. Paul heard. The Colossians heard. And I think this theme of hearing actually frames the entire introduction here. So that's the angle we're going to take to look at this intro, this angle of hearing. And there are three points I want to talk through, and all three of these are connected to hearing, and all three are connected to one another. So it goes like this. First, Paul heard something because, second, the Colossians heard something because, third, Epaphras said something. So that's what we're going to do the next half hour. Check out first, Paul heard something. This is verses 3 to the beginning of verse 5. Let me read it again. Paul says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. So here in verse 3, we see what it is that Paul heard. See there in verse 3? Paul is thanking, the, thanking God for the Colossians because, verse 4, he heard... First about their faith in Christ Jesus, and next he heard about their love for all the saints, both of which flow from the hope laid up for them in heaven. So Paul has heard about the Colossians, faith, love, and hope. Faith, love, and hope. Or is it faith, hope, and love? And the greatest of these is love. 
Right? We've, we've heard these words before. We've seen these three words put together before in the Bible by Paul. These words, faith, love, and hope, are explosive words. They're used a lot in the Bible, and they're used a lot in our language today. They're common words. They're the kind of words that we put on T-shirts, the kind of words that we hang on walls and use in presidential campaign slogans. And, and the, you know, These are buzz words, faith, love, and hope. And all three of these words, buzz words as they are, they're all three lined up together in verse 3 of Colossians 1. So I want to know, what's their connection? What's the connection between faith, love, and hope? And what did they have to do with Paul hearing about the Colossians and then giving thanks for them? So let's start first looking at faith and love. Paul says that he has heard about the Colossians' faith in Jesus and their love for all the saints. And both of these have to do with relationship. First, there's the vertical relationship of faith in Jesus, and then there's the horizontal relationship of love for others. And, and we've seen this type of vertical, horizontal pair before in the Bible. Jesus taught us in uh, the great commandment, Matthew 22, some Pharisees come up to Jesus and they ask Jesus, Jesus, tell us, what is the greatest law? What's the most important law? And Jesus says to them, you guys know this verse, he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. That's the vertical. We are to love God. We're made to love God. We're made to worship God. And then Jesus says, hey, let me tell you about the second commandment. You didn't ask about the second commandment. Let me tell you about the second commandment. Jesus says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, loving God and loving others, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Love God, love others. That's the vertical, that's the horizontal. And Jesus says that this pretty much sums up all of God's law. That's what he says in Matthew 22. Jesus wants us to love him and other people. And in Colossians 1, Paul tells us that the Colossians have done this. He's heard about the Colossians. He's heard that the Colossians have done this. They trust in Jesus. Their relationship with God has been restored. They put their faith in him. They worship him. Therefore, that's the vertical. They also love the saints. They love other people besides themselves. That's the horizontal. The Colossians love God, love people. Paul heard about that. And at this point, I think most people from any religion would say that this sounds about right. That we should love a supreme being, we should love, venerate something bigger than ourselves, and we should also love our fellow humans. Most religions would say something like that. They'd advocate something like that. I don't, I don't think that all religions can back that up. For example, I don't think a jihadist has any intention of loving his neighbor. I don't think that's the case. But most religions where there's human decency and political correctness, they would say that, hey, we just want to love God. We just want to love other people. That's what we're all about. That's what we're all about. We're all the same. I'm getting this partly from just recently I saw, you guys may have seen this, there was a video online, uh, BuzzFeed put out this video. It was this interview between a Christian priest and a Jewish rabbi and a Muslim imam. And they were talking about uh, just kind of like current issues and remarkably, they all agreed on everything, you know. Who knew? <laughs> they, they, they all agreed on everything. And at the end of the interview, they kind of ended it by saying, you know, our, our traditions, they didn't really even call them religion. They said, our traditions are all different, but we're all trying to get at the same thing. We, basically, we want to love God and love people. And I want you to know, just to be sure, I don't think the Apostle Paul has that in mind here in Colossians 1. For, for a couple reasons. First, there's nothing generic about the vertical part that he mentions here. Paul isn't talking about generic veneration of a generic higher being. He says that he's heard of the Colossians' faith, faithfulness in Jesus Christ. He's heard about their trust in God the Son, the second person of the Holy Trinity, who was made incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became human who was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, suffered and was buried, who was raised again from the dead on the third day, who ascended and is seated at the right hand of the Father, who will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. Right? We just talked about this in the Jesus series. That's who Paul is talking about here. The Colossians trust in this Jesus and they love all the saints. And just to be clear, Paul means nothing generic here when he talks about this vertical dimension that he's heard about the Colossians. And we especially see this, I think, and how faith and love are connected to hope. Faith is in Jesus. Love is for the saints. Now, how are they connected to hope? Look at verse 4 again. Paul says, 
since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. And, and the word here, because, is translated in other places as through or by, and that depends on the case of the noun that follows it. For example, if you look in verse 1, the word by, by the will of God, the word by in verse 1, is the same word translated because in verse 5. The difference is subtle here, but there, there is a difference, and it, it matters because this word is helping us, helping to describe for us how faith and love are connected to hope. Is it because, is faith and love because of our hope, or is it through our hope? Again, it's subtle, but I think it matters. And I like the way the NIV translates this verse. This is what the NIV says in verse 5. They translate it and say, We've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love of that, uh, the love that you have for all God's people, verse 5, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven. In one sense, faith and love are because of our hope, but it's actually more than that. Our faith in Jesus and our love for one another actually comes by or springs from our hope, which I think means there's a closer connection than just saying because. Because, just saying because is kind of a broader kind of safer word, but by stepping forward and saying, actually, it it springs from our hope. There's a closer connection between faith, hope, and love. And we talked about hope last week. Our faith and our love springs from the future hope secured for us in heaven, and that is, as we talked about, that one day Jesus is going to return here and make a new heavens and new earth. One day Jesus is going to come back, and at last he will destroy everything that impedes our relationship with him. One day Jesus is going to come back, and we are going to be with him forever. That's our hope. That's the hope laid up for us in heaven. That's our hope for the future and this future hope of being with Jesus is from that hope that springs forth our faith and love today and this is important because there's no rabbi or no imam on the planet who's going to tell you that this is Christian faith and Christian love that flow from a Christian hope and that Christian hope is the hope of being with Jesus in a new world It's from that hope that we have this faith and love. And Paul says, hey, Colossians, I've heard that you guys have this. I've heard that you believe this. I've heard that you live this way. And therefore, I give God thanks for that. I thank God for you because of that. That's what Paul heard. And he heard it because, our second point, the Colossians heard something. So Paul heard what he heard because the Colossians heard what they heard. Look at verses 5 and 6. Verse 5 again at the end. Paul writes, of this, our hope, Of this hope you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. So notice here, the word heard is used again, used twice in these verses. The Colossians heard something, and we see in verse 5, they heard the word of truth, the gospel. So, The Colossians heard the gospel, they heard the gospel, they understood the gospel, which means Paul heard about the Colossians' faith, love, and hope because the Colossians heard the gospel. And by gospel here, I think Paul has in mind what he says in 1 Corinthians 15 when he describes the message he says of first importance. The gospel is the the announcement that Jesus died for sinners, that he rose from the dead, that he's now ascended and reigning as Lord of all, and that he's coming back to make a new world. And that when, when we turn from our sin, and believe in him, we are by spirit, united to him, and restored to fellowship with God. That's the gospel that the Colossians have heard and believed. And those two pieces of believing and hearing always go together. Believing and hearing always go together. Think about this for a minute. If we in this room, if we right now, if we believe the gospel, it's because we've heard the gospel. We believe the gospel because we've heard the gospel. It was that way in the first century. It's that way in the 21st century. Faith comes by hearing 
hearing by the word of Christ. Faith comes by hearing the gospel, which is exactly what Paul says in Romans 10, verse 17. Faith comes by hearing the gospel. We can't believe the gospel until we hear the gospel. And, and that always, when we think about it that way, it always boggles my mind a little bit. Because if you step back and you look at a world map and you see where we are in North America, way up, but you see where we are and you look where the gospel message began, that's a long ways from Jerusalem. It's a long ways. And yet we believe the gospel because somehow in God's providence we've heard the gospel. It always makes me feel small and blown away. And like, wow, I can't believe we believe this stuff. I can't believe we heard this thing. But we do. And we do because, as Paul said, the gospel is bearing fruit and increasing. This is verse 6. The gospel is bearing fruit and increasing in the whole world. The message of the gospel, Paul says, the message of the gospel is spreading. It's going forth, it's spreading. But the gospel is not the only message that spreads. It's not the only message out there in the world that's going forth. At the same time of the gospel's advance, there have always been counterfeit gospels going around. As, as people hear the gospel, at the same time, they hear other things. Other things are always talked up and put out there as the hope of the world. And there are so many of these, so many counterfeit gospels that we couldn't begin to list them all. But I want to try to, labor, uh, to label a few. I'm going to try to identify three counterfeit gospels. And if you got, do you guys know, you guys ever use sidewalk chalk? Do you guys remember when there was no snow on the sidewalks? And, and this, yeah. Well, I'm thinking about what I'm doing now. Is like I'm kind of like I'm riding with sidewalk chalk, which means it's kind of like big and blocky, and there's not a lot of detail. I'm just kind of these are big brush strokes. I'm just kind of kind of sweep through here. But what I want to do, I want to name three major movements of counterfeit gospels that have spread throughout the history of the world, simultaneous to the gospel's advance. And I want to warn you here. This is going to be a little bit historical, which means some of you guys might find this boring. I like history, so like I dig this, but I know we're different. And so if, uh, if, if, you, if you find this boring, hang in there. Give me five minutes, okay? The point is this. I want us to know that as the gospel has spread over time, there have always been other things that compete with the gospel. As the gospel spreads, counterfeit gospels have also spread. Other popes are put out there. Let me tell you the first one. Uh, I'm calling it the counterfeit gospel of dominance. And I have in mind here mainly imperial Rome. This is the setting of the New Testament. Um, imperial Rome. There have been several world superpowers in, in history, but Rome, of course, was the greatest. The Roman Empire was the mightiest of all. And that theme actually resounded throughout the first century world. When, when Christians came onto the scene and they were preaching that Jesus is Lord, others were saying and had been saying and continued to say that Caesar is Lord. So Christians are saying Jesus is Lord. Others are saying Caesar is Lord and Caesar led conquest. Caesar, he grew an empire. Caesar had a mindset of dominance and conquest that lived on even years after the Romans faded. I mean, really, this, this counterfeit gospel of dominance, I think it lasted throughout medieval Europe. It lasted through the feudal system. It lasted all throughout the European class divisions that we saw. The message was dominance. The hope was that we can be in control. I mean, it's not good for those who, aren't, who are not in control. But for those who are in control... That was the hope. That was the message going around, the counterfeit gospel of dominance. And as that message was going forth, the gospel was going forth at the same time. And that came right up to, I'm calling this the second counterfeit gospel, the counterfeit gospel of change. And for this, I have in mind the 16th century, really up to the 20th century. You know, the, the message of dominance, it never went away completely. But another message began to, to kind of come onto the scene in the 1500s. And that was kind of this, this revolutionary mindset. Um, there was a lot of good that came from this, such as the Protestant Reformation um, and all that. Um, but that wasn't the only type of change that happened in those days. At the same time that there was needed reform in the Christian church, there were also social and political upheavals going on. Um, there's this one historian named Carter Lindbergh. Joe may know this guy. He wrote this book called European Reformations. And the key is reformations is plural. And the point that he's making in the book is that 
the Reformations in Europe were never one unified movement. It was little pockets of of social unrest and political upheaval and revolution and reform that took place all over Europe because that was kind of the spirit of the age. And I think that this this idea, this counterfeit gospel of change, it went all the way up to the American Revolution and then the French Revolution and beyond. And the hope here was changed. The hope was that the masses could make a different make a difference and revolt against the rigid systems of dominance and class division. That was the hope. That's what people said. That was the hope that was put forth. That is, at the same time that this revolutionary uh, counterfeit gospel of change was put forth, at the same time, the gospel of Jesus continues to advance, continues to spread. And it comes now to, uh, we'll say, the late 19th century, 20th century. And this is the third movement I'm calling the, uh, the counterfeit gospel of self. The counterfeit gospel of self. And with this came the hope of autonomy, the hope that all we really need is the self. And what you had here in the counterfeit gospel itself is for the first time, there was a vision of the world that didn't need God. It was a vision of how to live in this world without God. It's anti-institutional, anti-establishment. It had roots in the European reformations, but what it really did was mark the rise of the counterculture and kind of mark the rise of of non-conformity. That was kind of the, the spirit of the age that began at this time. Have any of you guys seen Downton Abbey before? I learned all this from Downton Abbey. Okay. Just so you know. That's where I'm getting my information from. Um, well, the counterfeit gospel of self, it really continues to today. I mean, that really is what's happening today. There's just this counterfeit gospel of self that goes forth. I think it's summed up best by this phrase called expressive individualism. That's the phrase that the philosopher Charles Taylor uh, puts on. This is how he defines it. Uh, this expressive individualism, this counterfeit gospel of self says, says that when people, people are encouraged to find their own way, discover their own fulfillment, do their own thing. And according to Taylor, it, this way of thinking really got popular in post-war America after World War II in the 1960s and 70s. And that's when you started seeing the kind of, this kind of stuff in TV commercials and you started hearing it in music. And that's when therapies and life advice started going around that tells people to discover themselves, to realize their true selves to be authentic and all that stuff right we've heard this before we've heard this counterfeit gospel this is the counterfeit gospel of self that we still see today and at the same time as this counterfeit gospel of self is going forward the message of jesus is also spreading the gospel of jesus continues to spread and uh for example what are we doing here we planted a church in this world. We have planted this church with a mission to make disciples, to spread the gospel of Jesus. And we've done this, we're doing this right now in the middle of a culture, in the middle of a society, in the middle of a world that's saying, actually, all you really need is yourself. That's the way it's always been. Out of all the things that we hear, out of all the things that we hear, only one gospel can really give us hope. That's the gospel of Jesus dying for sinners to make us new while we're constantly fed empty promises and while we're constantly giving gimmicky worldviews only the gospel of jesus can deliver what it promises only the gospel of jesus turns all the other counterfeit gospels upside down like this the gospel of jesus tells us that greatness doesn't come by dominance but by serving that the change we need doesn't come by cataclysmic revolution, but by being restored to who God made us to be. That the self and its authenticity is not the purpose of the universe. But instead, it's just one part of a larger purpose that's always connected to community, to the church. And that purpose is to spread the news of God's love for God's glory. That's, that's the gospel of Jesus. And we should be encouraged that through all the movements of history, through all the counterfeit gospels that have been spread and are being spread, the message of Jesus has never been stopped. It has never been silenced. It has never been overcome. Counterfeit gospels will come and go, but the gospel of Jesus is always there, always advancing, always being heard and believed just like it was here in Colossae in the first century. And that brings us to the last point. We saw in verses three and four that Paul heard about the Colossians' faith, love, and hope. And he heard about that because it was all in verse five. The Colossians heard the gospel And now at last we see that the Colossians heard the gospel because a guy named Epaphras told them the gospel. Point three, 
Epaphras said something. Verses 7 and 8. Paul heard something because the Colossians heard something because Epaphras said something. Look at verse 7 for a minute. The Colossians heard the gospel and understood it. Verse 7, just as, Paul says, just as you, Colossians, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love by the Spirit. And you guys will notice that the word for here, here is not used in these verses, but the idea is implied. Okay, so the Colossians learned the gospel from Epaphras, which means they heard it from Epaphras because he told it to them. And then next in verse 8, we see that Epaphras was the one who told Paul about the Colossians. So Paul heard about the Colossians because Epaphras told him. So if we were to step back and look at these first eight verses, if we looked at everything together, Epaphras is the guy who's behind it all. He's the one who first preached the gospel to the Colossians. And then when they heard the gospel and believed, he's the one who went to Paul and told him all about it. And therefore, Paul wrote the letter. So really, Epaphras is the guy behind, it all comes back to Epaphras. He's the guy behind this all. Real quick, does anyone in here know someone named Epaphras? (laughs) Of course you don't. Oh, maybe one, okay, one one person. Most of us don't know someone named Epaphras, and I, I have a few reasons why. There are a few reasons probably why. Let me give you one reason why. The reason most of us don't know someone named Epaphras is because he's a marginal character in the Bible. Most people don't know who Epaphras is. Most people don't care who Epaphras is. Epaphras is a minor character. He's one guy off behind the scenes. He gets a few mentions here and there, but he's never prime time in the Bible. He's just an ordinary guy. He's probably moderately gifted. he's, He's no Apollos, right? He's no Apollos. He's probably moderately gifted. He probably grew up with people making fun of his name. He, he, he's, just a, he's just a regular regular dude. And then one day, he's in the city of Ephesus, most scholars, scholars believe. He's in the city of Ephesus, and he hears this man named Paul preaching the gospel. And Epaphras is in Ephesus, and he hears the gospel preached, and he believes. He hears the gospel, and he believes the gospel, and then he travels back home to Colossae, and he goes to all of his friends, and he starts telling them this message of Jesus that he has heard and believed. And then the Colossians hear it, and they believe it, and then Epaphras says, i got to let Paul, the Apostle Paul, know about this, and then he gets word back to the Apostle Paul. And I, I think this is so fascinating, that if we step back, All that's happening, all that's behind Colossians 1, all that's behind this entire book, all that's behind this church that was planted in Colossae, it's it's, it's one guy, one guy named Epaphras who heard the gospel, believed the gospel, and told others the gospel. So think back for a minute. Uh, As I I mentioned, you know, all of us, um, if we believe the gospel now, remember I said this, if we believe the gospel now, it's because we heard the gospel. Right? If we believe the gospel, it's because we heard the gospel. Well, if you've heard the gospel, it's because someone like Epaphras has, has walked into your life. Right? We've heard the gospel because someone has told us the gospel. And so we may not know someone named Epaphras, but we've all had someone like Epaphras to come in contact with us, to step into our lives, and to tell us, about Jesus. We believe the gospel because we heard the gospel, and we've heard the gospel because someone told us the gospel, and chances are they're probably just as normal as Epaphras was. Might have been your parents. Might have been your college roommate. Maybe it was your coworker. Maybe it was your neighbor. Maybe it was your friend. Might have been your slow pitch softball teammate. Whoever it was, this moment, if you believe the gospel in this room, if you believe the gospel, Someone told you the gospel. Someone told you the good news of Jesus, which means that we all, all of us have an Epaphras in our life. And it seems like to me, the natural way to close this sermon is for us to think about that. Who is that person in your life who is like Epaphras? Who is that person in your life who told you the good news of Jesus. Think about that person right now. You may have several. I had several people in my life. It took a lot for me. 
several people in my life who were like an Epaphras to me who told me about the good news of Jesus. Maybe you have several too, so just do that for a minute. Just, just think right now, who is it in your life that told you the good news of Jesus? Think about that person and let's just give thanks for that person right now. Like, in the same way that, that the Apostle Paul is giving thanks for the Colossians because of what they heard, um, because of what he heard, about what they heard, because of what Epaphras heard and said, let's just take a minute. Thank God right now for that person in your life. Thank, thank God for the person who told you the gospel. And now I, I want to encourage you as we thought about this Epaphras, as we thought about the people the person, the people in our lives who told us the good news of Jesus. I want to encourage you, because it makes sense, I want to encourage you to be an Epaphras for someone else. I encourage you, I encourage us together to share the love of Jesus, to tell others about the good news of Jesus, just like you've heard the good news of Jesus. And we don't need to do it. Look, don't think, we're not, we don't do this here. I'm not, I'm not gonna shame you or try to guilt you or be like, you know, the world, the whole world depends on you. It doesn't, okay? Tell others about the love of Jesus because this is the greatest news in the world. This is the greatest news in the world. And when we stop and think about it, when we stop and we think about this news, the fact that we have heard it, which again, look where we are on the map. We've heard the news of Jesus. It's amazing. We've heard it. We've believed it. And now in God's grace, we have this amazing gift of privilege and amazing honor to be called onto the mission of Jesus and to make him known, to speak it to others. It's strange if we think about it. It's strange that knowing who we once were, knowing who we are, that Jesus would love us and that Jesus would call us to his mission and let us tell of his good news. It's strange, but strange, of course, in a happy kind of way, and that brings us to the table. So I want to ask the servers to come forward. And the strangeness of it all, the strangeness that we believe the gospel, that we get to tell others, it's strange because if we're thinking right about it, we know how much we don't deserve this kind of love. We, we know we don't deserve this love, and yet God loves us still. Jesus has made us his. Jesus has called us onto his mission. And it's overwhelming that we get to do this, that we get to believe this, love him as we do, be loved by him as we do. And that's what this table is all about. This table... Uh, the bread and the cup here remind us of the love of Jesus for us, the love that's overcome our lives, his, his body broken for us, his blood shed for us, and the fact that as we receive these elements, we didn't work for this. We don't earn these, but these are given to us by the grace of God. And so, therefore, this is the meal that we do each week for those who have received the grace of Jesus. We do it for the, the members of City's Church, and if you're here and you've received the grace of Jesus, we invite you to, to eat and to drink with us. And if you're here and you've not yet believed the gospel of Jesus, I just want to say, thanks so much for being here. I really, I'm, I'm, I'm so honored that you would sit through all the stuff that I just said. <laughs> so thank you for being here. And we, we want you to know you're always welcome to come back. Thanks for being here. You can just pass the elements to the people beside you, but do come back, please. Thanks for being here. Now, as we serve the bread, uh, we do have a gluten-free option. So if you want gluten-free, just raise your hand. We'll get that to you.